questions. Uh, the first one, now the federal government appoints people to the board. It's too bad that the federal government appointees were not sensitive to the Ukrainian issue. Maybe we should put pressure on the federal government who appoints all the directors. So in here, our federal government is failing us because obviously they didn't listen to the Ukrainian community. Because let's face it, it's the board of directors that set what the museum should be doing, how they're doing it, what they're going to include. It's not arbitrarily the staff, so maybe to get pressure on the directors to re-examine this issue, maybe we should put some pressure on the federal government who's funding this more than half of the cost. That's one question, and your view on that. And the second question is, there's another major tragedy that the museum is not looking at, and that is the period after the Second World War when they had the Yalta Conference and Uncle Joseph had the right to take back all his people from the DP camps. The Western Allies accommodated that, and hundreds of thousands of people were shipped back the British archives have been open for three or five years already where it goes in great detail of how they would round up these so-called Soviet citizens, the majority of them Ukrainians, they would load them on the train and reports from the British military was as the trains are leaving they hear the machine guns going and people were jumping off so that's not one of the issues that this museum is looking at. We are calling upon you to reach out to your members of parliament so they know that there are, is an issue. That being said, and you make an excellent point, it is the role of the government to put in a board of trustees that is open to listening and making sure that this museum is done right. That's number one. But also, we need to make sure that the museum hears about our disappointment. And it can't just be from ongoing negotiations with myself and UCC, it has to be from you. And it has to be from not only our community, but encouraging other communities in Manitoba to speak out against this. So we need to educate other communities about this issue because there is frankly too much misconception, uh, distortion of what the issue is all about. Reaching out to the museum is important. So writing to the, the chairman of the board and to the president of the museum, expressing their frustration and supporting the position that the Ukrainian Canadian Congress has, has put forward. Attaching a copy of our media release and our position paper. And reaching out to the board, to the president of the museum, and also looking at the friends. The friends of the museum still have a long ways to go to reach their target. And quite frankly, the donors need to hear that we're unhappy and why. Because they're being kept in the dark. I have approached some of the donors. And some of the donors have withheld further funding of their commitment until these things are fixed. So we need to reach out to those donors, and it needs to be done by everybody. So it's, it's federal politicians, it's the museum board and management, and it's the donor community, it's the friends. This was supposed to show the Canadian experience of immigration to Canada by the various immigrants. And I opened my mouth and I said, well, you know, what a lovely place to show the experience and the abuses that the Ukrainian Canadians experienced in Western Canada when they came in through Winnipeg, the main entrance area to Western Canada, and we built Western Canada. And the museum is in Winnipeg. And we were told, well, this aspect is not considered in this area. And I couldn't believe it. I just simply could not believe it. How is it possible that you would not mention the major influence in Western Canada and you did not mention that as one of the major points? I don't think we can allow the museum to proceed without having a serious input on the contributions, the difficulties, the abuses, the discrimination, and everything else that came with the changing of the names, uh, speak white, uh, and everything else that came with it. That is part of the Canadian history and Canadian heritage. If 
very important one, and it must be part of what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. After 10 years of putting up a museum, why do you think Cook suddenly will succeed? As I explained today, that the Ukrainian Canadian Congress has been involved in this issue for the last 10 years. We're going to hold our heads high that we've been consistent in what we wanted for the last 10 years. And we have presented our positions very strongly and accurately. We've seen, we're disappointed today on what, we've, what has been unveiled to us, even though we've had a lot of words presented to us. And I'm sure the Winnipeg community knows this very, very well, where the leadership of the, of the museum has come to Ukrainian events and has said, the whole Demois will be presented permanently and prominently. We all, we all, uh, we all applauded it. And we've been, frankly, hoodwinked. I want to know what action plan Cook has to go to the media, to talk to others than the Central European communities, others, the religious community, the national communities, the opposition parties. Either we're going to make this a Canadian issue, and you know, there's negotiating in good faith, and there's time to get angry. I'm sorry, but I am so angry I could spit. All the funding will be waiting until they get it right. And what is getting right? Getting right is making sure that it's equitable, it's fair, and it's Canadian. Canada should be ashamed of itself, Monsieur Le Maru. We're leaders in human rights. We're Tell us who the funders are. Tell us who the Ukrainian funders are that are holding back. Let them hold back. We'll applaud them for holding back. There is a process for this country to do the right thing. It's the Canadian way. Please look at the legislation. Find a Ukrainian person whose people died at Hall of the Law, and let that individual file a complaint with the commission and say, you are discriminating against my people who died in Hall of the Law like other people have died, and do it. So I encourage you to do two things. Give to the Congress so we can actually have the funds to do this, and number two, get involved and volunteer. And I ask all of you to do that. Proshul. Getting in touch with the MPs is a, is a viable solution because you have to sort of relate information to them. Some of them are very naive about it. How much money has the Ukrainian community put into the museum? The main thrust is money. No matter if you like it or not, it's Russian. Quite frankly, if we're going to put in human rights issues into a national museum based on which group gave the most money, then we're buying human rights. And that, quite frankly, is wrong. And I will tell you that the Ukrainian Canadian community has given. There have been several million dollar donations made from prominent Ukrainian Canadians. There have been organizations that have given. Some local Winnipeg organizations have given. They've stopped giving after finding out where this is all at, but they have been given. And most importantly, we make up 1.25 million Canadians of Ukrainian heritage. That's a significant taxpayer base. We don't want more smoke, we want fire. We want something concrete that is powerful that can happen right now. And we need your help to raise the money to be able to do that, to educate Canadians about this issue. So you have my commitment. But I need your commitment to help us raise that $40,000 to put in ads in national papers. Do we have any response from Vancouver, Regina, Calgary, Montreal, and uh, Halifax? Do we have any response from Ukrainians there who will support this group here? This issue of the Canadian Museum of Human Rights is the top issue for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress and for the entire Ukrainian Canadian community. You have my commitment on that. Right, thank you. We want to see this museum to be a success. We don't want to see placards in front of the museum. And that's why we're calling on the museum to listen to us today before it's too late. UCC, of course, has our support in uh, carrying this uh, issue forward. Um, I would, however, not be quite so benevolent to uh, the Canadian government uh, and the role of the Harper government uh, in regards to this whole issue. Um, as you said, uh, Bill C-42, which basically provided the skeleton for this whole project, uh, it was brought in by the Harper government. Uh, one of the first things that the Harper government did when they came to power is to cancel support for heritage land needs. And uh, this government told multicultural communities across the country that if we're interested in these kinds of issues, we need to fund them ourselves. 
for the Human Rights Museum, they have given $130 million out of general tax revenues for a project that I think has been very poorly managed. I think it has set community against community. We have been pitted one against the other. Um, and I think that the government has some responsibility in leading on this issue. And so I think our criticism should be carried there. I mean, they do set, they set the parameters for this project. They funded this project. They appointed people to run this project. And I think they have real responsibility. So my question is, should we have given Harper a medal? Why has this government been so bad on this issue? That's an excellent question. And the response that we're getting when we meet with the Minister of Heritage, James Moore, is that they've appointed experts to the Board of Trustees. They are responsible for building this museum. And it's inappropriate and impossible for the government to directly influence what a Crown Corporation and a independent board of directors does. They don't do that with the CRTC, they don't do that with the CBC, and they're not prepared to do that with the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, as we've been told. That is the response that we are getting. And that just as we will see, the minister will see the same in 2014 when the museum opens, what it's going to look like, because he's entrusted that to the Board of Trustees. That, quite frankly, is not an acceptable answer. Because we found that when there are controversial issues, the best way to get them resolved is by building consensus and unanimity amongst our, our policymakers and amongst our legislators. It will be a world-renowned, world-class, national museum for human rights. And there's no reason why human rights, the human rights issues that impacted so significantly our peoples and have such an important human rights story to tell to Canada and the rest of the world should not be a very prominent part of that museum. The Ukrainian community is, is leading the way in terms of ensuring that the whole of the war is properly represented inside uh, this wonderful world-renowned museum that we're going to see. But the impact is not, goes far beyond our Ukrainian community. And it has the ability to be able to make connections on a, a world issue that needs to be remembered. As a member of parliament and on the parliamentary committee, I can tell you that there are MPs of all political parties, individual MPs, that truly do care about this issue. Whatever we can do, I'm sure you'll find that there are MPs of all political stripes that are prepared to do it because they know it's the, the right thing to do. And maybe if we get MPs from all political parties doing the same thing, that might help influence. Like, you know, prior to the content board, my recollection was, and I was an MLA before, is the real issue came to the surface back in the end of November, or November of 2010, when the contents committee released its report. Prior to that, I think there was an assumption that the whole of the war was going to be prominently featured. It wasn't until that content report became public uh, that it became the issue that it is uh, today. Know that you have uh, MPs on the Hill from all political parties that are, in fact, sympathetic and wanting to do something, and we do look uh, for your, your support in, in whatever way you can. And for Paul, and I know your association's met with me and my leader at least on two occasions in the last year, and I know that we need to continue to put the, the pressure on. We've seen recently by now the, uh, the, the profiles being released of what the galleries look like. We've seen it, we've done an actual tour, and we went back to the community and said, we are outraged. We need to build this momentum so we can, we can actually invoke change. So that's why I'm here. I'm here to tell you about what's going on. We're talking to our community across the country. I'm in Alberta later this month. We're in Saskatchewan the month after. We're building momentum. And we need you all to help us build the momentum. Bill? Thank you. So that raises the whole question of what is the strategy? You're talking about a full page ad, or two, or three. What's the focus? Writing letters to MPs is good, and I think Kevin's comments here, and I think that the message is that there's only 13 MPs in Manitoba, and I think most of them really understand what the issue is here. We can keep doing that. But I think the real message here is that if you want to influence 
the functioning of a crop corporation. Government has only one major way of doing it in terms of money, but they appoint the, the directors. Maybe the time is to make the message that we have a vote of non-confidence in the directors of this crop corporation. it into the hands where the minister can do something. And I think that if you're going to make any message, whether it's three panels or six panels or 14 by 18 or is it one room or two rooms or whatever is confusing to people, it puts one group against another, against another, against another. And I think that you want to stop that altogether and you want to make simple messages. Number one, and, and here I want to make a comment. I was trying to make the, some comments about uh, uh, the early years in Cook's uh, involvement. I was directly involved for the first three years of this whole project in our department, departmental officials. I worked with Minister Cox. I watched this whole process go. And I have to tell you, Cook was remarkably involved. They did a tremendous job. They made the case and it carried through. I left government in 7, 2007, and it's continued. So you can't fault Coop. They made the case all the way through. There was a change in government, and it was only, and here I have to correct you, it was only Harper who made this into a crown. Uh, uh, Paul Martin resisted in the worst way and did not make it into a crown. He did not appoint the board. It was a Harper appointed board from day one. So, uh, and, and secondly, he was doing it on the basis of commitments that were made by the Christian regime, basically, and then, and then Paul put in a few more dollars, but basically, it was a cumulative effect. So, um, he was only uh, converting that interest, and, and basically the negotiation was who was going to pay for the operating costs of the museum. Because up till then, the Asper family was dead against government involvement. They wanted them to pay money for operations, but stay out of governance. And the choice was either if you want money, then you've got to accept the governance. If you don't want money, then uh, you can run it yourself. So in the end, it was Harper who made the decision, and it became a crown, and he appointed the board. But now that it's there, the problems that we have is that as a crown, your strategy has to be intelligent enough to reflect that this is a crown corporation. You treat it differently than a government policy. <coughs> so, let's not invest money in wasted fruit. If you're talking about that, pick your point. Vote of non-confidence. And then in behind the scenes, maybe the negotiations are, maybe we want to add three members from our community to the board. Or four or five, or, you know, or maybe we want to be involved in this election. Those things do happen. And, and I think that's, that's the way to approach this very complicated issue. Then the last one. You mentioned in your presentation, I'm glad you did it, that original agreement, I was involved in calling that first meeting. Is he after phone me and asked me to say, I need to support some Ukrainian community leaders. Could you call them together? And I had to form that meeting uh, and work very closely from the government side as you negotiated back and forth to get some sort of support. Uh, that agreement has, I believe, residual effect and should be binding on the front. When I met with the key man, don't forget the first managers of the, of the new, newly formed crown came from the Department of Canadian Heritage. And I met with some of them frequently. Nobody knew about that agreement, or so they said. I believe that it wasn't given to them. And I think that, it, but that doesn't excuse them. Because as I was saying, the Cretan money and Martin money was, was the basis for a Harper decision later on. It's a cumulative effect. One follows the other. And so I think the, 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 the position should be, we go back to that original agreement, 
And I think that's the communication strategy. We want, why do we want, well, why have we lost confidence in the board? They reneged on the deal. And I think they should go after the board, not confidence, and it's because of reneging on the deal, period. And let people research why. Then you can go back and send out information to MPs to say, here's the copy of the deal, here's what we got. And about the gas for a commitment, it's something that we will reintroduce to that discussion, and I agree that, that those, are, those are excellent responses, so thank, thank you very much for that. I think it's a multi-pronged attack that's required. And being nice, unfortunately, doesn't seem to work. There were over 80 MPs who publicly came out and supported the position of the Congress on the Human Rights Museum. We have a petition on our website which people can download, which we sent to all of our branches and our member organizations across the country. The call to action, which was issued on Friday, is the next step in the process. And it's as a result of this kind of public discourse that we are getting the word out.